that. And then following the service and the baptism, there's a, uh, a, a church uh, uh, dinner in the fellowship hall, and everybody is invited. And everyone say amen. 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 Psalms 27, one of my favorite psalms. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even my enemies, came upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Though a host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war should encamp against me, this and this will I be confident. One thing have I desired of the Lord, and that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord, and to inquire in his temple. For in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion, and in the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me, and he shall set me upon a rock. And now shall my head be lifted up above mine enemies round about me. Therefore I offer in his tabernacle sacrifices of joy. I will sing, yea, I will sing praises unto the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice, have mercy also upon me and answer me. When thou saidest, seek my face, my heart said unto you, thy face, Lord, will I see. And everyone say amen. amen. Next Sunday, um, Brother Rick's going to be going to be preaching. And uh, it's also our second in, uh week and part of our reset series and in light of him speaking next week I wanted to go ahead and preach on the next reset theme and it's Lord reset my mind I mean want your mind to be reset Amen. David said one thing have I desired of the Lord and that will I seek after that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. We've been talking about resetting. That Jesus changes everything. And I'm here to declare to you on this Sunday morning. Jesus does change everything. Amen. And you will recall we talked about resetting your heart last week. Today I want to talk about resetting our mind. And in November on two of those Sundays. We'll be talking about resetting your voice and resetting your hands. Well, you know, to reset something is to restore it back to its original design. In computer language, we go back to our default settings. To set something back to its original purpose, to its original intent. And so for these weeks, we've been talking about our spiritual life and how we can reset that and find fulfillment and find that abundant life, that blessed life, in Jesus Christ. Paul said in 1 Timothy, the 6th chapter, verses 8 and 19, where he says, That they do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate or be social, laying up and store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come, that they may lay hold on eternal life. Our gathering here this morning is another opportunity for you and me to lay hold on to eternal life and do not let it go. So that when we come to the end of our days and we're ready to cross over to the other side, we will not have any fear of what's on the other side. The same Lord that's been with me on this side is the same God who's going to be with me on the other side because I put my trust and my confidence in him. So we're talking about resetting the soul, and I'm so glad that you're here today, because we're going to talk about resetting your mind. There's a, a, an Iwo Jima. It's a small island in the Pacific, uh, Pacific that where, where, where uh, there was one of the most ferocious battles of the entire World War II campaign. It was fought. It was fought at great cost and at great lives. Why? Because that little island in that Pacific had a strategic value that was extremely enormous for both sides, whether it was the Americans or the Japanese. And so this 
little tiny idol, island in the Pacific experienced a ferocious battle in which thousands upon thousands of people died, men died. Because whoever gained control of that little island in the Pacific would have the advantage in the war. I thought about that story and I also thought about whether you and I recognize it or not. There is a strategic battle going on right here, right now, in which you are and I are fighting for our life. And the outcome of that battle will determine whether you have the advantage in your spiritual victory or not. The outcome of this battle will determine whether your life is filled with joy, with peace, and with blessing, or your life is going to be lived in defeat and struggle and depression. And what is this battle? It is the battle of the mind. It's the battle of the mind. It is the battle in which all things are fought. You see, the mind is the doorway into who we are and what we are. And so this battle for the mind is extremely strategic. In fact, the Apostle Paul said to one of the churches, Don't you let the devil get a foothold into your life. How does he do that? He does it through the mind. I like I like one of the other words it says about foothold. It says, don't give the devil a beachhead into your mind. Because when somebody gives the devil a beachhead into their mind, he will wreak havoc with your thinking. And you won't think right. You won't think properly. Paul said that we need the renewing of our minds. I want to read to you three, three verses in Ephesians, the fourth chapter. Paul says that you put off concerning the former behavior of the old man, which is corrupt according to deceitful lust. In other words, our natural life, our firstborn, when we were born, we were born corrupted, fallen, sinful. We didn't become sinners because we sinned. We were we sinned because we were already sinners. And so that old man, he says, is corrupted, it's fallen, and it's in disarray. So he says, you have to put off that former lifestyle. Then in verse 23, he says, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. In other words, have a spiritual reset in your mind. And that you put on, everyone say put on, the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Folks, what is Paul saying here? He's saying we need a reset. There are times in our lives, just because you and I have been born again at some point in the past, doesn't mean that today is not a good opportunity to hit the reset button on our mind so that when we leave here today, we have the mind of God and we have the mind of Christ. So he says, be renewed. And that word renewed means keep on being renewed in the spirit of your mind. Let the Holy Spirit do something in your life. You see, God created us with a good mind. In fact, Paul talks about having a sound mind. Boy, when you look at the world today, it doesn't look very sound, does it? Everything is very, very chaotic. And there's attacks on Catholics and there's attacks on Christians and evangelicals and all this is going on. Well, it's a battle for the mind of our nation. It's a battle that's going on. Paul noted that people of faith have a good mind. They have a sound mind. God has not given us a spirit of fear, right. but of a sound mind. I, I came across a list of famous people in the past who were devoted to the Lord, who were devoted to God. Uh, Sir Isaac Newton, the Wright brothers, uh, George Washington Carver, um, Jen Irwin, the, the, the astronaut, Samuel Morse, Louis Pasteur, uh, Nicholas Coper Cop Copernicus, and uh, the Polish astronomer. All these had a faith in Jesus Christ, a faith in God, and in their professions. They didn't separate their life. I know we hear in politics today that you have to separate your religious life from your politics. Well, my, my religious life determines my politics. I can't separate that. What I believe determines what I think. It determines how I view our world, how I view our nation. 
Galileo was a, uh, in 1564, 1642, was an Italian physicist. Here's what he said. I do not feel obligated, obliged to believe that the same God who has endowed us with sense, reason, and intellect has intended us to forego their use. He said, what minds that God has given us we need to use for his glory and for his honor. Folks, you don't commit intellectual suicide when you become a Christian. You get a new mind. You get a new way of thinking. You get a new life. You get a new path. Hallelujah. You have new joy. You have new happiness. Mr. Kepler, Janus Kepler in 1571, 1630, he was a German astronomer. He proposed the three laws of planetary motion that are still understood today. He advanced great theories. He says, since we astronomers are priests of the highest God, in regard to the book of nature, it befits us to be thoughtful, not of the glory of our minds, but rather, above all else, of the glory of God. Can you say amen? amen. Blaise Pascal, 1623-1662, a French mathematician. He said this, there is a God-shaped vacuum in the heart of every man which cannot be filled by any created thing, but only by God, the Creator, made known through Jesus Christ. Can you say amen? amen? He went on to say, but by Jesus Christ and in Jesus Christ, we prove God and teach doctrine and morals. Jesus Christ, then, is the true God of men. Isaac Newton, an English mathematician in 1642, 1727, he said the laws of gravitation and motion, mo motion develop calculus. Major contributions of optics and physics and math and astronomy. Here's what he said. The solar system itself could not have been produced by blind chance or fortuitous causes, but only by a cause very well skilled in mechanics and geometry. Michael Faraday in 1791, 1869 was an English chemist. He discovered benzene, electromagnetic induction, lines of force, relationship between polarized light and magnetic fields. He was a strong believer in the little interpretation of the scriptures. He was a deacon and elder in his church. And here's what he said. Since peace is alone in the gift of God, and since it is he who gives it, why should we be afraid? His unspeakable gift in his beloved son is the ground of no doubtful hope. Lord Kelvin in 1824, 1907, he was a British physicist. He was the one that looked at and came to a knowledge of the laws of thermodynamics, absolute temperature scale, transatlantic cable. Here's what he said. I believe that the more thoroughly science is studied, the further does it take us from anything comparable to atheism. He said, you can't believe in atheism if you study science. I want you to know, just because you become a Christian, you don't do away with what God has given you, the good mind and the gifts and the abilities. But you take those gifts and abilities that God has given you in that mind and you use it for the glory of the Lord. David said in Psalms 27, he says, when the enemies would come up against me, they would stumble and fell. He talked about the literal physical armies that would come up against him. But I want to talk to you, and it was an actual experience for him, but the correlation is true. There are spiritual battles that you and I will come up against, and they're always battles for the mind. They're always battles to affect the way you think. And as a man thinketh, so is he. The way you think determines the way you and I live. This is the army that besieges us today. It is an army that we come against. I'd like for you to, I'd like to draw your attention to Mark, the fifth chapter. I'm going to be reading this out of the message. But it's the story of the, the Gadari demonic man who was filled with a lot of demons. It says this, and they on the other side, and they arrived on the other side of the sea in the country of Gadarenes. And Jesus got out of the boat. A madman from the cemetery came up to him. He lived there among the tombs and graves. He could not, they, no one could restrain him. He couldn't be chained. He couldn't be tied down. 
He had been tied up many times with chains and ropes, but he broke the chains and snapped the ropes. No one was strong enough to tame him. Night and day he roamed through the graves and the hills, <coughs> screaming out, slashing himself with sharp stones. And when he saw Jesus a long way off, he ran and bowed and worshiped before him, then bellowed in protest. What business do you have, Jesus, son of the most high God, messing with me? I swear to God, don't, don't give me a hard time. Jesus had just commanded the tormenting evil spirit, out, get out of the man. Jesus asked him, what is your name? He replied, my name is Mob. I am a rioting mob. Then he desperately begged Jesus not to banish them from the country. And a large herd of swine or pigs was browsing and rooting on a nearby hill. The demons begged him, send us to the pigs so that we can live in them. Good place for them. Jesus gave the order. But it was even worse for the pigs than it was for the man. Crazed, they stampeded over a cliff into the sea and drowned. Those tending the pigs, scared to death, bolted and told their story in the town and country. Everyone wanted to see what had happened. They came up to Jesus and they saw the madman sitting there wearing decent clothes and making sense. No longer walking, no longer a walking madhouse of a man. The King James Version says there he was sitting in his right mind. Those who had seen it told the others what had happened to the demon-possessed man and the pigs. At first they were in awe, and then they were upset, upset over the drowned pigs. They demanded that Jesus leave and not come back. And as Jesus was getting into the boat, the demon-delivered man begged to go along. But he wouldn't let him. Jesus said, go home to your own people. Tell them your story. What the master did. How he had mercy on you. The man went back and began to preach in the ten town area. About what Jesus had done for him. And he was the talk of the town. I bet he was. I bet he was. The reason I, I, I chose this message. I like one of the phrases it says here. Jesus offered this madman, offered this man a reset of his mind. Jesus delivered him, and the scripture tells us here that no longer a walking madhouse of a man. No longer a walking madhouse of a man. Let me tell you something real plainly today. You have an enemy, and he is called the devil, and he is real. Just look at the turmoil in our nation. Look at the turmoil across our world. There's all kinds of, of chaos and confusion. People everywhere are not thinking rightly. It, just, it, 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 it shocks me. I guess it shouldn't, but it shocks me because I see so many people who are literally have lost any realm of common sense. And, but that's the way sin is. Sin is insane, folks. Sin destroys Sin kills. Sin brings death. Sin brings heartache and trials and diseases. It brings disorder and distress and turmoil. It brings a sense of utter pandemonium. It's like being in a zoo or three ring circus or all hell breaking loose in people's lives. What we are witnessing in our world is a battle for the mind. And people's minds are being attacked. And it's a struggle. But see, the answer for this madman and the answer for our world does not lie in who inhabits the White House. It lies in the church house with people who know their God and understand what God can do in a person's life and how he can change them. You see, the answer to life for this madman is to come to Jesus. That's the same thing for you and me. Whatever turmoil you're experiencing in your life, I want you to know the Bible says when this madman, and he was filled with and possessed with a lot of demons, when he saw Jesus, he came and bowed before him. 
That's the answer to every single life. That's the answer to every marriage. That's the answer to every home. That's the answer to every addiction. That's the answer to every sin that easily besets us. You see, he rushed toward the answer. He did not run away from the answer. He rushed toward the Messiah. And we may not have demons like that in our lives as a story, but we have a battle for our mind today. And that battle rages. And it's in a service just like this that each and every one of us can turn to Jesus and get a reset of our mind so that we start thinking properly. We know there's a battle raging for the dominance of your mind. That's why Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, he says, For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not carnal of this world, carnal weapons of this world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. He says we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. You see, we need to know that there is a battle that's raging. We need to know that there is a Christ who can help us with our thought, our thought life, and our thinking. Paul tells us, and I'm quickly coming to a close. Paul tells us, put off the old man. Put off the old life. Put off that old way of thinking. Get rid of it. Lay it aside. You're saved now, so now act like it. You belong to the Lord. So now live a life that's pleasing to him. And he tells us in verse 23 that we need the renewing of the spirit of our mind. How do you do that? You do it just like you're doing here today. You are hearing the preached word of God. And faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And as you involve your mind in hearing and taking in the word of God... You have a reset in how you think. It comes through a knowledge of the Word of God. I am so shocked, and I guess I shouldn't be, but how many Christians today are just biblically illiterate? If you ask them to, to quote a Bible verse, so many Christians across this country probably could. Oh, they might come up with Jesus wept. But the more of the Word of God I get into my mind, the more I gather around Bible studies and small groups and worship services like this, the more I become like Him and the more my mind is reset into the image of Jesus Christ. Romans tells us, Paul says in Romans 12, don't be conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. I like that word there, transformed. It really comes from the word metamorphosis. It's like a caterpillar turning into a beautiful butterfly. And the Bible lets us know that the more of the word of God we get in our mind, we are transformed. We are metamorphosized from an ugly caterpillar to a beautiful butterfly by the renewing of our mind. The Greeks came to the disciples and said, sir, we would see Jesus. And in the New Testament church, there was a group of people who said, they perceived that they had been with Jesus. How did they perceive that? Because he had the, they had the same characteristics in life as Jesus did. Do you know what this world needs? It needs a church. It needs the people of God to be transformed by the word of God into the image of God. That's what this world needs. Like I said, it's not the who, who, who resides in the White House that will determine the salvation of this nation. It is the church house. And the people of God being transformed by the word of God. And going out like he told this man. I want you to tell everybody the story of what happened to you. Every one of us has a message here today to tell the story of what God has done for us. But in a service like this we need a reset of our mind. The Bible says trust in the Lord. It's, this is one of Megan's favorite passages. Proverbs 3, 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And do not lean on your own understanding or thinking. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your path. It starts with the mind and what we're feeding the mind. 
Well, in closing, more than a century ago, two neurologists were studying the effects of the brain on the body. In other words, they wanted to know how what we think impacts how we are. <coughs> this happened to be in the days when women wore huge hats. Those kind of fancy hats with feathers on top that added a good 10, 10 to 12 inches to their height. The researchers noticed something, that when women who typically wore these massive hats, when they were walking through doors, they would duck even if they didn't have a hat on that day. Their mental self was wearing the hat, the researchers noted, even if their physical self wasn't. And I want you to know, when we reset our minds, our actions and our behavior will become second nature through the power of the Lord. And when you walk through the doors that grace opens up to you and me, when we have a transformed mind, when we begin to think as Jesus thinks, and when we allow the Word of God to get into our hearts and our lives, when we reset our minds to this wonderful, powerful, eternal Word of God that is quick and it's alive and it's sharper than any two-edged sword, when we get that Word into our minds and into our hearts, it will change us and we will live such a way that it will be second nature to us because how we think is the way we live. What kind of mindset we have is the way we will live our lives. If God is ca a casual acquaintance of yours, you will live in a casual way. If you reject the Savior, you will live in a way that uh, is destructive. But if you hear it now, as so many have already said, Lord, I want you to be Lord of my life. I want you to take my mind. I want you to take my mind. I want you to take my heart. I want you to take all of me. God wants to reset you back to the original purpose that he made in Adam back in the garden. A perfect man without sin. In fellowship with the creator. That's exactly what the Lord wants to do here today. If you'll just let him reset your mind. I'd like you to stand together. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.